Guten Tag. Good morning. Today is one of my favorite days because it's a fifth grade, fourth and fifth grade read aloud of the invention of Hugo Cabret. If you missed the other chapters of the invention of Hugo Cabret by Scholastic, it's published by Scholastic Press. And thank you, by the way, Scholastic, for allowing us to read these stories during this time. The author is Brian Selznick. And if you've missed the other chapters, you can go back to other Fridays in the past when I started the book and went up to chapter six. But let's continue without further ado. Chapter six, Ashes. The next day at the crack of dawn, the old man was opening his toy booth when Hugo approached. I thought I might see you today, said the old man as he turned toward Hugo. He reached into his pocket and removed a tied up handkerchief and held it out. Hugo's eyes widened, hopefully. But as soon as he took the handkerchief, he understood what he had been given. His breath caught in his throat and tears began to form in his eyes as he undid the knot. Hugo touched the ashes and then let them fall to the floor with the handkerchief. He staggered backward. All of his plans, all of his dreams disappeared in what's a scattered in that scattered pile of ash. Hugo changed. He charged at the old man, but the old man was quick and caught his arms. What is your attachment to this notebook? He demanded as he shook Hugo. Why won't you tell me? Hugo was sobbing. As he tried to release himself from the old man, he noticed something strange. The old man seemed to have tears in his eyes, too. Why in the world would he be crying? Go away, the old man whispered, letting go of Hugo. Please, just go away. It's over. Hugo wiped his eyes with his dirty, ashen hands, leaving long black smudges across his face. He turned around and ran off as fast as he could. Hugo was exhausted but it was time to check the clocks again. For a moment, he considered giving himself up. He'd never get, he'd never get the message from the automaton now, so he might as well turn himself into the station inspector and be sent to the orphanage. At least there, he wouldn't have to steal food and worry about the clocks breaking down. But the thought of losing the mechanical man was too much to bear, and he had grown to love it. He felt responsible for it, even if it didn't work, at least at the train station, he had it nearby. Hugo set to work on the clocks, but no matter how he tried to distract himself, he kept seeing the handkerchief filled with ashes. He was angry with the old man and he would never forgive the girl for lying to him. At the end of the day, Hugo put down his bucket of tools and sat next to the clock he had been checking. He placed the railroad watch in the bucket, pulled his knees up to his chin, and held his head in his hands. The steady rhythm of the clock lulled Hugo to sleep, but he dreamed of fire and woke up with a start. Frustrated and sad and finished with the clocks, he finally returned to his room and tried to sleep. But his mind wouldn't stop spinning, and so he reached for a scrap of paper and a pencil from one of the boxes near his bed. He sat down on the floor and drew pictures of clocks and gears, imaginary machines and magicians on stage. He drew the automaton over and over and over again. And he kept drawing until his mind calmed down. Then he slipped the drawings underneath his bed into a big pile of other drawings he had done and climbed finally fully dressed into bed. morning came and the clocks were waiting as always. After Hugo had finished his rounds, he washed his face and his hand and hands in his basin. 
He was thirsty and longed for a hot cup of coffee. It was impossible to steal coffee since someone had to pour it. So he searched through his jars and came up with a few coins. Hugo bought, bought himself the coffee and sat for a moment at one of the empty table, the empty cafe tables. He preferred to pay for what he could with the coins that he found each week, and he tried not to steal anything he thought people needed. He took clothes from the lost and found and scavenged the garbage for day-old bread, and sometimes he allowed himself to steal fresh bottles of milk or pastries when they were left outside in the cafe early in the morning, as his uncle had shown him. The toys, of course, had been an obvious exception to his rule. The coffee was hot, and as Hugo let it cool, he looked around the cavernous station at all the people rushing by with a thousand different places to go. When he saw them from above, he always thought the travelers looked like cogs in an intricate swirling machine. But up close, amid the bustle of the, the stampede, everything just seemed noisy and disconnected. When Hugo picked up his coffee again, he noticed a folded, that a folded up piece of paper had appeared on the table. He looked around but there was no one near enough to have left it. Slowly, he unfolded the paper. It read, Meet me at the booksellers on the other side of the train station. That was all. But then Hugo turned the paper over, and there was one more sentence. Your notebook wasn't burned. Okay, so uh, we're working on inference today, and on um, chapter six, what can you infer this was in this picture? because Hugo was crying and he kind of like gave up and said it's over. So what did you think this was? Write it in the comments or email me. I'm gonna put my email in the comments right now before we move on to chapter seven. Okay, chapter seven, secrets. Hugo had never been inside the bookstore before, but of course, he knew exactly where it was. He knew every inch of the train station. Opposite the cafe, not far from the main waiting room, there were two wooden tables covered in books flanking a door that read, Ar la Bis, bookseller, new and used. A little bell jangled as Hugo stepped inside the store. He was rubbing the buttons on his jacket, and one came off in his hand. He slipped it into his pocket where he continued to rub it. His heart was pounding. The place smelled of old paper, dust, and cinnamon. It reminded him of school, and a brief flash of his old life pleasantly filled his memory. His best friends, Antoine and Louis, had both had black hair and they liked to pretend they were brothers. Hugo hadn't thought about them in a while. The taller of the two boys, Antoine, used to call Hugo TikTok because he always had clockworks in his pockets. Hugo wondered about them. Did they still pretend they were brothers? Did they miss him? Hugo remembered that sometimes at night, father would read to him from amazing adventure stories by Jules Verne and a collection of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales, which were Hugo's favorites. He missed being read to. A clerk sat at the desk between two tall piles of encyclopedias. Hugo looked around. At first, he didn't see anyone else in the shop, <clears throat> but then, like a mermaid rising from an ocean of paper, the girl emerged across the room. She closed the book that she had been reading and motioned for Hugo to come over. Remember to pause and describe the picture. Tell me at least three things you see in this picture. Go ahead and say it out loud. Pop 
Papa Georges still has your notebook. How do I know you're not lying? You lied before. I didn't lie. He's tricking you. Why are you telling me this? Why don't you want to help me? Or why do you want to help me? The girl thought for a moment. I want to see what's in your notebook. You can't. That's a secret, said Hugo. Good. I like secrets. Hugo thought she was a very strange girl. She called to the clerk sitting at the back of the store. Monsieur Le Bis, I'm taking the book on photography. I'll bring it back soon. Yes, yes, fine, fine, he said distractedly as she left the bookshop without looking at Hugo. Part of Hugo did not believe the girl. Maybe she was playing a trick on him. But since she had nothing to lose, since he had nothing to lose, he marched over to the toy booth and waited until the old man was finished with his customers. The cogs and gears in his head were spinning out of control. What are you doing here? Asked the old man. He took a deep breath. I don't believe you burned my notebook. You don't? The old man seemed surprised. He thought about it for a few moments and said, Well, I don't really care. Maybe you're right. Maybe those were not the ashes of your notebook. But you won't ever find out, will you? Hugo inched closer to the booth. The old man calmly straightened the toys on the counter and said to the boy, You should not have returned here, Hugo Cabre. Now go away. Hugo did. But later, alone in his room, while he scurried through the walls fixing the clocks, Hugo thought about the automaton. He convinced himself he had to keep trying. He returned to the toy booth the next day and the day after that. At night, new drawings accumulated beneath his bed. Finally, on the third, third day, the old man came at him with a broomstick. Hugo flinched, thinking that the old man was going to get him. But instead, he raised the handle toward Hugo and said, Be useful. Hugo took the broom and began to sweep the floor around the boards, around the booth. The old man, the old man watched carefully. When Hugo finished sweeping, he handed the broom back to the old man. Now give me my notebook. The old man coughed and reached into his pocket. He pulled out some change. Go buy me a croissant and some coffee, unless you're going to steal my coins too. Hugo happily grabbed the change and returned quickly with two croissants and two coffees. They ate and drank in silence. I want to talk about a little cultural capsule here. I'm going to stop for just a second. When you are in France or Spain or other places in Europe, when somebody gives you money to buy something, it's assumed that you get to buy one for yourself too. So one person will buy for two people or the whole group. And then later on, it'll be your turn to buy for everybody in your group or the other person. So that's how things are done. You don't just buy your own. Like in the United States, you usually go Dutch, which means you split the bill and you buy yours, they buy theirs. But in Europe, uh, you always treat someone else and then they treat you. Okay. When they finished, the old man got up from the, the bench and they were sitting that they were sitting on went behind the counter and found the remains of his little blue wind-up mouse that Hugo had stepped on when he got caught stealing from the booth. The old man laid the crushed pieces on the counter and said, fix it. Hugo just stared at the old man. I said, fix it, he repeated. I need my tools, Hugo said. The old man took out a small canister of tiny screwdrivers, pliers, files, and brass hammers. Use these. Hugo hesitated for a moment, but then set to work. What is Hugo doing?
Okay. Is he succeeding? It looks like he is. The mouse skittered noisily across the counter. So I was right about you, said the old man. You've got some talent. Now, will you tell me why you came to me? Will you tell me about the drawings in your notebook? Give it to me first, said the boy. The old man exhaled. If I didn't burn your notebook, there's only one way I would even consider giving it back to you. Children like you are not worth the rags you wear, but most children like you would have disappeared completely after being caught, and most children like you aren't so good with mechanical things. Maybe you will prove there is more to you than being a thief. Perhaps you can earn back your notebook. But remember, you are gambling with your time because you might work for me for months and months only to find out you were wrong about the notebook. There's a chance it's already gone. That's the risk you'll have to take. You'll come to the booth every day. I will decide how long you must work for each of the items you stole. And it will be up to me to decide when you have earned back your notebook, if it still exists. Do you understand? I already have a job, Hugo said. The old man laughed. Thief is not a job title, little boy. I have another job but I'll come here when I can. You begin tomorrow, said the old man, and Hugo ran off down the empty hallway, careful not to click his shoe heels on the stone floor. This wasn't the perfect plan, but for Hugo, at least it was a start. All right, I'll see you next week for chapters eight and nine. Thank you for listening to the read aloud. And again, thank you to Scholastic for allowing us to read these treasures during this time.